There's an invasion of America. It is intentional. We have to acknowledge it, and we have to talk about how we're going to deal with it, but we can't get to any of that until we understand that it is intentional and why it is intentional. Why? Because it can get... It can get confusing for a normal person. Here you are in America, and you love America. You have some love of your country, right? And so you want what's best for it, and you may have disagreements with people. I bet you have disagreements with me about the direction we should go here, or direction we should go there. But in the end, you want what's best, and you like to think that the person you share a neighborhood with, a country with, that they also want what's best. But that's where we run into a problem. We don't share a country with a bunch of people who wants what best, what's best. We share a country with a bunch of people who want to destroy it. An open border is a path to guaranteed destruction of a nation. You know, there's a, a I don't want to say it's a saying, because maybe you've never heard of it before, but I had a buddy who used to say, and he was 100% correct because he, he lived the wild life and then he ended up you know, giving his life to Christ. He was this great family man later on in life and he would look back on all his wild younger days and he said, listen, Jesse, let me tell you something. There are two things, two things in life that no matter how much, no matter how much money you make, they can bankrupt you. Cocaine and gambling. He said, I've seen millionaires go broke on one or both of those two things. Cocaine and gambling. Those are two things that will finish you no matter what. And it, so let me do a, 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 an offshoot of that saying for a country. There are two things, historically, as a nation, that guarantee a nation will be brought to its knees, no matter how big, no matter how powerful, no matter the military, no matter the economy, no matter what. Debt and illegal immigration. It, you can't withstand a never-ending torrent of foreigners who aren't loyal to your country. No country, no matter the strength, can withstand that. You will eventually collapse. And the communists, to his credit, has understood this for years. They've been writing about this since the 60s. They, they have understood that an open border is a critical part of their plan to bring America down. America has been very, very hard for these people to bring down because they've been so strong. So they understand we have to flood the country with millions of dirt balls. And look, courtesy of James O'Keefe, we have an associate director of the Department of Defense. We keep catching these people now getting more and more honest about what they want and why they want what they want. Why not just have an open border? Yeah, like tear down the wall. Jason Beck, associate director, total force requirements and sourcing policy, says the country needs open borders. You know, just lots of that talk about, like, border security. Yeah, border security, what does that even mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's just, like, throwing money and people at a problem that doesn't really exist. When has a terrorist ever come in? They want the border open. They want the crime. They want the murder. They want the drugs. They want the rapists. It, I know it's hard to understand. But it's also why, look, it, it's why they're so careful about the language they use when it comes to illegal immigration. Notice how they will use the nicest sounding words at all times, and they will demand you use the nicest sounding words at all times. Look, here we are, we're sitting at what, pick a number, six, seven, eight million illegals in the past three years alone. That's an invasion. By any definition of the word, that's an invasion. Our country has been, is currently being invaded by any definition of the word, it's being invaded. Yet, people like Senator Chris Murphy don't don't want to use that word. Well, I mean, first of all, this invasion rhetoric is just absolutely disgusting. It's xenophobic. It's racist. You go to Ukraine, you see what an actual invasion looks like. See, this isn't an invasion. That's happening in Ukraine. Don't use it. But why? Well, got a little scolding on it from Reverend Al. But the border, I mean, we're looking every day at the invasion of migrants and they're playing a time game with politics on this. See, Al used the word invasion and Senator Murphy recoiled in horror and began an anti-invasion press campaign. Why? Well, because they need you to think about this invasion in the nicest possible terms 
so you don't catch on to what they're doing, you don't catch on to why they're doing it, so you don't angrily march to the polls with legion of your, legions of your friends to vote against every single Democrat, which most Americans, 70% of Americans would do if they understood what the modern Democrat party was actually doing and why they were doing it, but instead Democrats carefully use their language so you sit on the couch. So you stay home that day. I can't go to the polls. Certainly not gonna go knock on doors, catch a game last night. It's the ultimate benefit for Democrats. Another word they've been using when it comes to the invasion of the, all these illegals is they've been calling them migrants. You've heard me rant about this a thousand times. Migrant this, migrant that. What about migrants, migrant, migrant, migrant? Well, why? It's very simple. You don't get off the couch to go vote these people out of office because there are some migrants. Uh, migrants, what are those, birds? I bet they're pretty. Now, if there were 8 million illegals who came into your country, that might be something that gets you off the couch. Why do you think, look, Joe Biden in his recent State of the Union had a little brain melt, as he does from time to time, and accidentally used the word illegal when he was speaking off the cuff. Less than 48 hours later, he was on a press tour apologizing for it. You use the word illegal when talking about the man who allegedly killed um, uh, Lake and Riley. An undocumented person. And I shouldn't have used illegal. I should have, it's undocumented. Look, they built the country. The reason our economy is growing. We have to control the border and, and more orderly flow, but I, I don't share his view at all. So you, you regret using that word? Yes. Of course he regrets using the word. And people on the right didn't get that either. How could he say, I don't understand? But well, I know you don't understand. That's the problem. For these people, Language is everything. Why? Because deception is everything. Honest people don't have to tiptoe around what language to use. They can just use whatever word comes to mind. But deceptive people, they have to be careful about their language. Therefore, they have strict message discipline on the left so America can never fully know what they're doing. We can't have the president speaking off the cuff and being honest. We're, we're in this to deceive, Joe. This is about deception. You got honest for a moment, and that was a problem. Joe, get out there and apologize. After all, they're migrants. They're migrants. Speaking of uh, Chris Murphy, remember, this is Communism 101. Communism 101 is always about revolution. That's what communism is, is. It's a revolutionary religion. Burn down everything. Burn down the order that we know. And as a revolutionary religion, they will create problems on purpose and then blame other people for the problems it's been one of the most guaranteed ways these people have gained power over and over and over again and they've been incredibly successful at it remember the saint george floyd riots well that took place under president trump now you can sit here and say well that took place in these cities where trump didn't have any authority and you're correct about that but the american people in the end did not make that connection they didn't run to the pools and blame democrats for the Antifa Black Lives Matter street animals out there. There was no Democrat backlash because shifting the blame after you create a problem is something effective. They are going to be somewhat effective blaming Republicans for the border. Republicans couldn't imagine a world in which they didn't have the border to run on this November. So I think we can flip the script on Republicans. Um, I wasn't looking to gain political advantage. I was trying to solve a problem, but they don't want to solve the problem. So our obligation is to go on offense and explain to voters that Republicans are not sincere when they say they want to fix the problem because they had an opportunity and almost to a person they ran for the hills. They talk about it all the time. They will now shift the blame here and understand how much power this truly gives Democrats. That's, the, that's what the frustrating part about this is how permanent these gains have been for the left. And they're permanent because we're not going to be able to deport these people. And stop with these ridiculous pie-in-the-sky dreams that we're going to have the military go in and deport 8 million people. It's not going to happen. The American people would, re would reject it, actually. One picture of a crying baby and the American people would be, oh, it's so sad, no more deportations. So it won't happen. 
And what's happened is these people who've all come in here, either they're already being registered to vote, you both know, well, you and I both know Democrats want to do that, but if, even if they're not, their children will all be American citizens, remember. That's how the law has been manipulated and abused in this country. You, you sneak across the border, you have a baby here, and you're going to vote Democrat forever. And these people know that they are importing millions and millions of new Democrats forever. Look, the illegals they interview on the border, they're down there talking, I love Joe Biden. Thank you, and thank you, Joe Biden, for everything. We love you, Joe Biden. You said thank you, Joe Biden? Thank you, Joe Biden. We love you. <laughs> All right. What are the real impacts of this invasion? on many places, New York, the border. We'll talk to Julio Rosas about that next. He used that word, invasion. He used much stronger language. Do Democrats need to uh, campaign in a st with a stronger message specifically on immigration. Invasion is not a word that I would ever use. It's wild, wild to watch them try to dance around this whole thing. It's crazy. Joining me now, my friend Julio Rosas, field reporter. You should be subscribed to his substack called Mostly Peaceful. Julio, you're down on the border all the friggin' time. Give us the true skinny on it. Are we being invaded? Is it an invasion or is that a bad word to use? No, it's certainly apt to what is happening for what has been happening in mass for the past couple of years. But even more than that, actually, I just posted a story on my Substack where I went to the southern town uh, in Mexico called uh, uh, Tapachula. And that's like the first major town that uh, migrants that go through Central America uh, encounter before they go through the rest of Mexico to reach our southern border. And even the Mexicans, like the Mexican locals themselves, one woman said to me that uh, they can't enjoy their town anymore because it's been overrun and that their town has been invaded. And they said that it became dirty. And it, it's just all these things. So it's it's not it goes beyond just what's happening in the United States. It's like the, the policies of the Biden administration is a worldwide disaster. And so, yes, people uh, have you know, there's been a lot of negative effects when it comes to people illegally coming into our country, but there's other people that are suffering around the world deliberately uh, as a result of the Biden administration. Julio, who are these people that are coming? A, a lot of Americans, even ones paying attention, don't really realize that it's not a lot of Mexicans anymore. It used to be about 50%, and the other 50% were OTMs, as you know, but that is not the case now. They are coming from every freaking where, aren't they? Yes, and the biggest example that we have of that is when the Haitians uh, crossed into Del Rio in mass in 2021. Um, a lot of people were asking, it was like, well, how did all these people get from Haiti to Del Rio, Texas overnight? Uh, and the simple truth is that they didn't come directly from Haiti. A lot of those people came from uh, South American countries after they resettled there after the 2010 earthquake. So they've been there uh, in Latin America for about 10 years. Uh, and then they realized and they saw that, oh, all these uh, Central Americans are getting into the United States a lot easier now under this president. So we can do the same as well. And of course, you know, the Biden administration did allow the majority of those people who are under the bridge into the United States. And of course, it's not just people from Haiti. It's people from all over the world. Personally, I've encountered people as far away as Uzbekistan, China and India. Um, and it's just all because of it's not really. You know, the, the Biden administration just views that this just needs to be a, a policy where people just need to be let in and we'll deal with whether or not that they have legitimate claims of asylum at a later date. Well, Leo, speaking of uh, in illegals and coming from all over, Lake and Riley has obviously been all over the news. You talk about Lake and Riley's killer back in 2022. What were these people saying back then? So when uh, Jose Ibarra illegally crossed into El Paso and was released, uh, that was in September of 2020. And El Paso was one of the sectors at that time that was uh, experiencing a massive spike. It, typically, a, a different sector uh, gets more than others at certain points. And so uh, Kamala Harris was saying that the administration had a plan. President Biden said uh, specifically in regards to what was going on in El Paso that they have a plan. Uh, Secretary Marcus said that laws were being enforced. 
Um, and so this just highlights, and of course, you know, they, they've been saying that for, for months and they continue to say that, um, uh, you know, fairly recently, but um, it just shows that as they're saying these things, there are direct consequences to this. And so, and it goes beyond just the fact that he was released into the United States because we knew, we know that he was in New York uh, first and he was arrested for committing crimes there. And he, you know, obviously the sanctuary laws uh, and, you know, the, the type of status that he's in. Uh, because of the U.S. immigration policies have changed. And so that allowed him to then c- go to where his brother was in Athens, Georgia, where they also kind of have, uh, you know, uh, sanctuary kind of county status there as well. Um, so it's just a cascading uh, effects of not just the national policies that have been disastrous, but also very much the local policies do have an effect on this. Lake and Riley obviously has been in the news a lot, but she's far from the only one, and she's far from being the first one, first American, who's been preyed upon by these illegals. Julio, you've been tracking this stuff. This stuff's been going on for years, always covered up, of course, by our evil media, but this is the norm in this country. Yeah, and it happens a lot more than than people kind of realize. And, and you have, I mean, there's a story in the New York Times recently that tried to downplay the, they say that there was no migrant, you know, crime wave happening. But actually, when you looked at the data that they were they were, they were being provided uh, and looking over, um, it actually kind of showed that even though crime in New York City, as the example, was kind of decreasing, um, still, I mean, still pretty high compared to pre twenty twenty levels. Um, it actually kind of showed that you know, based on this kind of you know thesis, is that uh, the migrants are actually kind of keeping the the crime rate a higher than they would normally be if they weren't in the country in the first place of uh, things like robberies uh things like pickpocketing and, and car thefts because those are the kind of uh crimes that we've seen most associated when it comes to migrants because you know that's kind of the easiest way for them to make money on on, on short notice and so um th- this is you, you know what, what i what i say to kind of that the whole like well there's no migrant crime wave is just the fact that well technically they're, they're not supposed to be here in the first place um, you know, so th- these crimes wouldn't be happening at all um, if the, the immigration policy and the border policy from the federal level was actually coherent, which, of course, it's not. And so therefore, yeah, there is this kind of chaos and there is this kind of uncertainty. And the thing that I'm most concerned about is the Venezuelan gang, Tren de Aragua, uh, which is basically Venezuela's equivalent to MS-13, and which is that is the main gang in Venezuela. Um, they're here. They're here in the United States. They've been here for a few years now, and they're solidifying their 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 footholds that they're established in Miami, Chicago, New York. Um, and we're going to see them uh, kind of no longer be in the setup stage, but they're they're going to start taking action um, now that they have the manpower and they have kind of the financial backing now uh, after being here uh, for for a year or two. Who are they working with here? I've heard about this gang that is pretty much pretty much just packed up and moved into America. Who in America are they working with? Uh, so they, they kind of create relations with local gangs. You know, they did kind of have a relationship with MS-13, but MS-13 is not as powerful as they once were, you know, in part because of what Venezuela, or El Salvador is doing to crack down uh, in, in, their, in, in their country. And so uh, Tren de la Agua, from my understanding, is kind of filling that vacuum that some of the other Latin American gangs uh, ha- ha- left now that they're no longer in the position that they, that they once hold. And the fact is, is that uh, the Maduro regime works hand in hand with this gang. And so it's not really, uh, it's, not, it's not unfair to say that this is kind of a state-sponsored uh, criminal organization. They, they, they created chaos back in Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela, of course, you know, doesn't necessarily want these people in their country, so they're allowing them to leave. Um, and in fact, the, the main prison in Venezuela where the leadership was held, um, they, they, the Venezuelan government moved in, uh, there was no fighting, and all the leadership was gone. And so there, there's speculation that the Venezuelan government uh, created a deal, made a deal with this gang, and said, we'll let the leaders leave and we won't have anyone die when we take over this, gang, over this prison. And of course, the prison was basically like this tropical resort where they had a pool, zoo, even a recording studio inside. And that just shows how much power that they had within within Venezuela. But like I said, uh, a lot of them are here now. Um, and unlike MS-13, they're a lot harder to identify because MS-13 tattoos their face, their chest, their arms, everywhere. Uh, Trenda Argo members, um, they do have tattoos. They do have kind of some 
uh, you know, symbols that they can easily identify with each other, but there are no, by no means, like covering faces is usually more, more hidden uh, more often than not. Great. Smarter criminals. Julio, thank you, my brother. I appreciate it. All right. We're not near done. Laura is going to join us next. Here at home, I've signed over 400 bipartisan bills. But there's more to pass my unity agenda. Strengthen penalties on fentanyl trafficking. You don't want to do that, huh? I didn't know Joe Biden was so against fentanyl. That is such great news. I bet you Laura is excited about this as well. Joining me now, Laura Reese, director of the Border Security and Immigration Center at the Wonderful Heritage Foundation. Laura. I thought after looking at his policies for three years that he was a big pro-fentanyl guy, but apparently he's against it. I don't know. What have you seen? Well, I haven't seen any change. He'll give lip service now that it's year four and he's running again for president. Uh, but really, all he's asking for is to throw good money after bad. If he wants to stop fentanyl, secure the border. That will stop fentanyl. Uh, but all he wants to do is say, hey, give me money and we'll investigate fentanyl. We'll help people who might have overdosed but not died from fentanyl. We'll help them recuperate. Uh, but that's about the extent of it. So it's lip service um, and it's pretty gross. Laura, I, I'm going to give you the floor here. Can you explain to the normal person how this poison gets to the streets of America? Because it's it, it's confusing. A lot people just don't understand the cycle. They don't understand the trade routes. How does it get here? Well, it starts with China. Uh, China sends the precursor ingredients. Uh, and unfortunately, they're rather basic ingredients. They have multi-use. They could be used for household cleaners as well. Uh, but China sends those to Mexico, and then uh, Mexicans will turn them into fentanyl, whether it's pills, whether it's blocks of the powder, uh, different forms. And then it is transported over the U.S.-Mexican border. It can go between the ports of entry. It can go through the ports of entry. And while God bless the border agents, they are looking for it and catching what they can, when millions of illegal aliens are crossing the border, that pulls agents off to process those illegal aliens and away from uh, parts of the border through which these cartels can send all sorts of drugs, including fentanyl, across the border. And then these smugglers uh, can go anywhere they want into the U.S. And so fentanyl has come to all communities in the U.S. and it has become the number one killer of young Americans. Laura, can you explain why we don't stop it at the source when it comes to China. That, that's a very common question I get by email. Hey, why doesn't some, someone in America's government, why doesn't Joe Biden pick up the phone and talk to Xi and say, hey, stop setting that here or we'll be mad. Why doesn't that happen? Well, when we have evidence that uh, Joe Biden and his family have received millions of dollars from uh, China, Chinese companies, uh, Chinese leaders with ties to uh, the Chinese Communist Party, his response to China seems a little bit clearer. Uh, so while he might say a few harsh words or say, hey, give me money and let's, let's investigate this, he won't and hasn't gone to the source to cut it off at the root. Uh, let's move on and talk about terrorism. Obviously, securing a nation's border is important for many reasons, and it's not just fentanyl. How many bad people do we think, obviously we don't know, have already come into this country and where are they coming from? Well, we know a couple numbers. We know that at least 1.9 million illegal uh, known gotaways have snuck through the border. They purposely evaded border patrol. They didn't sit down on right inside the U.S. border and wait for Border Patrol to process them. And they gave up that free plane ticket that taxpayers are paying for to take them anywhere they want to go in the U.S. So 1.9 million known gotaways. That's not even getting to the unknown gotaways. 
Why are they evading border patrol? Because they don't want to be fingerprinted. They don't want a background check. So we have to assume among 1.9 million are a lot of convicted, aggravated felons, either here in the U.S. or in their home country, known and suspected terrorists, traffickers, pedophiles, rapists, etc. We also know that CBP has caught hundreds of uh, people on the terror watch list each year uh, just between the ports of entry. Now, pre-Biden, that number was three in a year. Now we're looking at hundreds that CBP has caught. How many haven't they caught? We don't know. Uh, occasionally ICE reports that they have to go and pick someone up because we find after the fact that they are here. Um, but we have to assume there are many more here. Good grief. Uh, I remember when Joe Biden ran for president, he had a lot to say about kids in cages. Here he was. You know, he, he, he rips at families. He rips them apart at our borders. He puts children in cages. You know, a lot was made about keeping children in an enclosure when they got here. So what's happening with the children now? Well, Joe Biden is uh, proudly, I guess, responsible for a historic number of unaccompanied alien children who have crossed that border while he's been in office. We're at a, at least 480,000, I believe, unaccompanied alien children. Those are minors who either their parents sent them across the border unaccompanied or they chose to come by themselves. Um, many of them can be gang members because teenagers are making up a sizable portion of gangs. And so, you know, no one ever talks about that. Um, also, it must be noted that the Biden administration, if they want to keep families, true families, not fake families used for smuggling, uh, true families together after being caught or volunteer themselves to the border patrol that they should be housed together. And yet what's one of the first things Joe Biden did when he came into office, he got rid of all family housing uh, because he knows that just releasing them into the U.S. makes it extremely unlikely that they will ever be removed. We're talking less than 5% of the time. Uh, those who are never detained are removed. Talk about the schools. This is something people who don't live in these areas, I've lived in these areas for many years, but people who don't live in these areas with high illegal traffic, they don't realize what happens in the public school system with all these illegal kids. So as these, you know, just in a three-year time period, there's been tens of thousands in, in New York, where I think it's 20,000 kids have been uh, thrust upon the New York uh, City school district system. And what does that do to classrooms? It has them overflowing. What does that do to teachers who often already didn't have enough support uh, from assistant teachers or um, other specialists to run their classrooms? And many of these kids either don't speak English or it's not their first language. And so they may struggle with the instructions. They may struggle with the content of what they're learning. And so that pulls the teacher's attention to spend an exorbitant amount of time with these um, alien children and away from the Americans lawful resident uh, children who are in the classroom, which affects learning ability. It affects um, reading, math skills, et cetera. You combine this with what our kids have just dealt with coming out of COVID, and it doesn't bode well for our education system. Not to mention using school buildings and parts of schools, gyms, um, et cetera, for sheltering for illegal aliens. A lot of American kids have had to give up their, their rec centers, their parks, their gymnasiums uh, to shelter people who aren't supposed to be here in the first place. Yeah, please. All right, but finally to wrap this up, Jerry Nadler had, a, had a, an accidental honest moment, if you will, when he said this. And we need immigrants in this country. Forget the fact that the farm, that our, our, our vegetables would rot in the ground if, it weren't, if they weren't being picked by many immigrants. How much does our labor market rely on illegal work? 
Well, unfortunately, too much. Uh, but they always pull out the lettuce line. It's it's pretty gross. Um, they seem to have the mentality that Americans are um, unwilling to do difficult work, um, which is insulting and, and untrue. Um, and, and yet they do it. Also, we've, we've had members like uh, Yvette Clark from New York admit that she needs more uh, immigrants, particularly it was Haitian refugees in, in the context she was saying this, to help her with redistricting. They need the head count so that they can get more Democrat members in Congress in uh, new drawn congressional districts that shouldn't exist because we should just be counting U.S. citizens uh, in the census when only U.S. citizens can vote uh, to draw these congressional districts. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. We have Mark Kerkorian joining us next. on the border action happened by itself the passing the border action happened by itself not really sure what that means i can't wait to ask mark about that joining me now the big cheese exec executive director at the center for immigration studies my buddy mark krikorian mark okay We've obviously gotten long past that age where we're pretending like they accidentally stumbled and bumbled and opened up the border. This is all part of the plan, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it's a, it's all intentional. There's no question about it. I'm not sure plan yeah. is the word for it because I don't think they really pl they've planned much of anything. The, the, the reason they've done this and they're sticking to it, even in the face of political pushback, is they don't think it is morally right to keep anybody out of the United States. They think immigration law is immoral in itself. It's like Jim Crow. And so they were told in uh, 2020 and 2021, during that period between the election and the inauguration, the transition, where the two sides, the, the actual people working in the offices meet and kind of hand over the keys to the men's room and all that stuff. They were told, look, don't do this it's gonna blow up in your face. It's bad for the country, but it's gonna be bad for you guys too. Don't do it. They did it anyway, but I don't think it was a plan in the sense that they have a specific objective in mind. It's intentional because they think stopping, stopping people from coming here is wrong. And so um, of course this is what's gonna happen and they'll backtrack a little if they have to, hedge a little just for political expediency, but they don't believe it. They think it's wrong to keep anyone out of the United States. Okay, Mark, I, honestly, I hate to ask you to try to psychologize these monsters, but could you please explain that to me? How could any, any human being anywhere in the world believe controlling the immigration into their country is a bad thing? That's very clearly, obviously you're correct. That's what they believe. Why? Well, let me make clear, I'm not licensed to practice psychology in the District of Columbia, but um, they don't believe in countries. I mean, this is John Lennon's Imagine Song. This is the immigration policy of John Lennon's so Imagine Song. This is, they think that borders are like a county line. It determines who's gonna fill the potholes on either side, but that's all it means. It has no, people have a right to move to the United States if they want. This is a, a, a different worldview. And honestly, I'd almost prefer they were doing this for cynical political reasons to import voters, because that's something it's easier to fight. This is a basic disagreement about the, 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 the sort of the principle of nationhood itself. And that's, not something you can argue people out of. You just have to defeat them at the polls. There's no op there's no there is no other alternative. All right, we'll come back to that. You have a piece up about how a future administration can fix the border. We look at it right now and it looks unfixable, Mark, but it is fixable, right? Of course it's fixable. I mean, it was fixed 
three and a half, three years ago. And it wasn't perfect. I mean, there's a lot of things that the Trump administration still needed to do. And there were things that Congress does need to change. Uh, I mean, it's not the as though the immigration law is like totally perfect, but there's plenty to work with that you can um, unwind this. The problem is things are always easier to, I mean, always harder to stop than they are to start in this kind of thing. It's kind of like it's easier to tear a house down than build one. It's easier to tear the border apart than it is to build it, but it can be done. Look, why are people doing this? They're not doing this because of climate change or you know the life in the third world got worse. Yeah, this, it's bad in a lot of places, no question about it. This has happened though, starting January 20th of 2021, because this administration is letting almost everybody go. If you walk across the border, the odds of you're just being let go are really high. And um, look, these prospective illegal immigrants aren't stupid. They're weighing the odds. They're saying, is it worth spending this money, taking these risks? Uh, what are the odds of success? Under this administration, the odds are high. So the solution really is when you boil right down to it, you have to stop releasing people. You have to detain them, hold on to them, and then bounce them back to their home countries, disappointed and broke, so that the people who are there see, oh boy, I better not try the odds have now changed. And until they do that, this is not going to change, but it can change. And frankly, if there's a new administration, I think the odds are pretty good. It's going to turn around relatively quickly. Mark, how does, how does a nation, how should a nation handle a country like Venezuela, where they're emptying their prisons on purpose, they're dumping their problems onto us, and they're actually not allowing us to return Venezuelans back to Venezuela. So what do we do then? Yeah, the first, the first thing to know about Venezuela, about the immigrants coming from Venezuela, and also Haiti, this is true, most of them aren't coming from those countries. They left years ago and um, were, were settled somewhere else and then realized that they could trade up to come to the United States. Now, what you're seeing now is in fact that Venezuela is encouraging criminals to leave. And frankly, if you're reading the news in Haiti, the, it's a complete disaster area. The gangs have like taken over a jail and sprung everybody. So there is a real issue there. The first thing you need to do, first of all, is not let them go. You need to keep them in detention. You need to pressure countries to take their own people back. There are a lot of countries that slow walk or just refuse to take people back. And under this administration, we're not even taking the minimal steps to pressure them. But the big thing we need to do, and this is something that will require you know, some thought and diplomatic activity, we need to establish a good relationship with another country somewhere else and say, and pay them basically to take people that we can't send back. Uh, the British and, the De and Denmark tried this with Rwanda. They were actually say, sending illegal, they wanted to send illegal aliens to Rwanda. And the point was Rwanda would give them asylum. If you're really fleeing persecution, then why wouldn't you go to Rwanda, you know? Um, Israel actually succeeded sending illegal immigrants, regular African illegal immigrants to Rwanda until their Supreme Court nixed it. But the point is that kind of setup is the answer in the end to the kind of problem that you're talking about, which isn't just limited to Venezuela. I like to call it remain in Mongolia, because we should have an agreement yeah. with Mongolia, and it's a friendly pro-American country, pay them, you know, deliver money to their girlfriends, uh, their mistresses, Swiss bank accounts, whatever it takes, and uh, say, look, if you want asylum, Mongolia will give you asylum. Uh, if you don't want to go to Mongolia, then don't try to sneak across our border. Uh, enjoy life on the Asian steppe. I heard it's lovely there in the winter. Uh, but Mark, what can state and local governments do about the illegals? Because obviously we're not going to, we're not anticipating any big moves or help from the feds anytime soon. There's a lot state and local governments can do both to help the feds enforce immigration law or to interfere with the enforcement of immigration law. In fact, our current podcast, Parsing Immigration Policy on the podcast platform of your choice, specifically about this question, what can states and localities do? The place they can do the most is criminals that they arrest for regular reasons, not immigration reasons. 
drunk driver, somebody who's a drug dealer, beats his girlfriend, whatever it is, all of those people, anytime somebody's booked and fingerprinted, those fingerprints go to DHS. They go to FBI, but they also go to DHS. And so ICE knows who most illegal immigrants are. They have some paperwork on them. And what, an, what a sanctuary city means is they won't cooperate with ICE. But what states and localities can do is they can cooperate with ICE, enhance their cooperation. And at the state level, a state government can ban sanctuary cities within its state. Uh, the feds can't tell cities what to do, but cities are created by the state governments. They can ban sanctuary cities. So that's number one. Number two, you want to make your state less attractive to illegal immigrants, even if they're not criminals. And the key thing there is e-verify. Online system helps employers, when they hire somebody, tell whether the person is legal or not. And some states require it. Most don't. You want to act against illegal immigration? That would be you know, my job, I guess job two, after cooperating better with ICE. Mark? Wrapping this up here, the blue, these blue sanctuary cities, as they're known, as you've talked about many times, is there any saving them? They're just going to keep going down and down and down, especially now that they're flooded with illegals, too. It's just it's hard to see how this gets better in these places. It's a good point. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, New York does. I mean, the mayor of New York does seem to be very slowly with baby steps coming to the realization that even New York City needs border control. That you can talk about, give me your tired, your poor, say, Statue of Liberty stuff all you want. Mass immigration, especially mass illegal immigration, is not sustainable. And so essentially, eventually, the cost is going to force a reassessment, I think. And so all I can say is that Governor Abbott needs to keep bussing them to uh, these sanctuary cities. It's uh, the ones he's busing are not the majority of people going there. This is mostly Biden's doing, but the very fact that he's busing them there is forcing them to pay attention to something they would rather not pay attention. So all I can say is, you know, bus more. Yeah, amen. Mark, thank you, my brother. I appreciate it. All right, we're not quite done yet. Hang on. If you don't have a border, you don't have a country. If we don't find a way to stop this invasion and unload all the illegal scum that's already here, then we cannot save the place. It is that critical what is happening at our border. We are being remade. We are the gigantic bowl of soup, and they just keep pouring water in it and water in it and water in it, and soon it's not a soup anymore. It sucks. That's what's happening to this country. So we have to be a lot more animated and adamant about that than we have been. And that includes for the low TGOP on the right, who always caves in the end, who always call themselves immigration squishes. No more squishiness, all right? All right, I'll see you tomorrow.